because we have background noise and we don't hear the person we need to listen to. So please mute everybody. Thank you, Gloria. Welcome to all of you joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to give you a few bits of information before we start. First of all, we're going to be recording the session. So if anyone does not wish to be in the recording, would you please turn off your audio or your camera so that we, you're not seen? So if you do not wish to be in the recording, please switch that off. I would really, really appreciate if everybody stays muted so that we don't have any background noise. During the sessions today, we're going to use the chat. So if anyone wants to ask a question or you wish to make a comment, then please use the chat section and Gloria will be recording that. If we can now bow our heads, we'll open in prayer. Justice and right are the pillars of your throne, O Lord. Love and truth walk in your presence. Almighty creator, bring justice to our world that your people may live in the joy of your peace. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. They shall have their fill. Almighty Creator, bring justice to our world that your people may live in the joy of your peace. Good afternoon, everybody. Today is the fourth of our six sessions. This one is on cultural awareness and the evolving language of racism and racial justice. During this session, you will be able to reflect on your experience of how cultural awareness or its absence can affect the atmosphere in a school. We will also be discussing emerging terminology and how this relates to institutional racism. Our first speaker today is Margaret Ann Fiskin, and I'll hand over to Margaret now for a 15 minute input, which will be followed by a 10 minute discussion. Margaret Ann. I'm unmuted now. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Um, I was I was just saying I find this very um, challenging because there is so much that I would like to share with you, and the time is so restricted. So I'm going to make some choices. And I would really appreciate some feedback as to what you think is valuable and what you think you know, it's obvious we could do without it, perhaps the next time you do this or that. So I shall begin. Um, one of the challenges that we face, one of the big challenges when we're discussing concepts around race and racism is terminology. And the terminology that's used is both fluid and evolving. And I very am. often it isn't emotional. It isn't emotionally neutral, sorry. In fact, it is um, very emotionally charged sometimes. And in talking about issues of race, we have to somehow find a common vocabulary. And I think this is important so that we avoid misunderstandings and misinterpretations. The word race itself is troublesome. And here at Kaj, we say one race, the human race. But I think we always recognize that that's perhaps more of an ideal than a reality. Words often have different meanings to different people based on their experiences, ethnicity, location, gender, religion, and more. And negatively, not everyone is going to agree on the definition of every word. But 
everyone who's taking part in a discussion around race needs to have a common understanding of how words are being used in particular circumstances. And one of the things that I wanna emphasize in what I'm saying is that none of us has all the answers. It's important that we're able to discuss these issues safely, calmly, and respectfully. It's important that we understand the impact of our words, of what our words can have on others, and that we're prepared to take personal responsibility for this impact, be it positive or negative. At the same time, it's equally important that people can ask questions as to why certain terminology is deemed inappropriate or unacceptable. So I'd like to speak very briefly about a couple of issues that have been in the news this month and then mention, I was gonna say a few, but I think it's only gonna be a couple because of time constraints, words that have more, more recently been added to the racial justice lexicon. And then hopefully we can have a very open discussion. Um, so I'm by no means a football fan, but I was very interested in the resignation of Greg Clark as the head of the FA after using what was deemed to be unacceptable language when referring to black players. Now, this wasn't the only thing he said. He made comments about homosexuals and about women. And, but he, you know, I, from what I heard, um, he wasn't, the media seemed to focus on his comments about that black players, but it seemed that he, there was no malice intended in anything that he said. He was out of touch and he was certainly out of step with 21st century Britain, but I don't think he set out to offend anyone, but he, he had to step down, he had no choice. And people rang me, some were outraged at what he had said and some had huge sympathy for him because he used the word colored. And he was referring to something where black footballers were referred to as footballers of color. And he shortened it and said colored. And it was, that was deemed to be very offensive. So why is the term colored offensive? I think Gloria has a video, which is just like one minute that she's going to play that explains this, Gloria. Can anybody hear this? The word colored is antiquated and has the potential to cause offense due to the connotations of the word and its historical usage. The first half of the 20th century in the United States saw limitations placed on the use of public transport, buildings, seatings, toilets, and water fountains for black people. Many of these symbols of segregation prevalently featured the word coloured. The term coloured has traditionally been used to separate people and enforce segregation. It is outdated and belongs to a bygone age. As a civilised society, we have moved on. Show Racism the Red Card recognised that not only does language change and evolve over time, but appropriate terminology also differs from country to country. For example, we know that in some countries the term coloured is still used, and that in the US the term people of colour is quite common. The key difference is that the term people of colour is generally used in a positive manner to group people together and highlight common experiences and provide a positive frame as opposed to using negative words like minorities. During our work with young people throughout schools, we discuss the appropriate language to use when describing people of different skin colours or backgrounds and explain why the term coloured is no longer the best way to describe someone. Okay, thanks Gloria. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, it says a lot um, in a very um, short video, but you know, there are a lot of people who do still use the word colored and they don't mean it offensively. People have said to me, if I, okay, I'll, I'll give my second example before I say that. Um, another current example, again, this month of inappropriate language is Lord Kilclooney, 
who was a former deputy leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. And he referred to Vice President-elect Kamala Harris as the Indian. And he tweeted, what happens if Biden moves on and the Indian becomes president? Who then becomes vice president? Now, I personally think this is offensive. Harris is mixed heritage and her nationality is American. But is it racist? He says it's absolutely not. And while some of his fellow peers have censured him, most have stood by him and don't see what all the fuss is about. And again, people have said to me, so is it racist if I say I am going to, let's get an Indian tonight, referring to a meal? Is that racist? I don't know. I mean, people have different ideas. Um, and if we're asked, what is an appropriate response? What do we say? Is there a right or a wrong answer? So what terminology is acceptable? There is a lot of usage of the terms and reports. Official reports and organizations use BME or BAME whilst others deem those expressions to be un unacceptable. BME, Black and Minority Ethnic, and BAME, Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic, have significant limitations. One is that they suggest that individuals are a homogeneous group. If you're not white, you fit into this group. The second limitation, obvious limitation, is that they can, they can appear to be convenient descriptions, but they're not generally identities with which the people themselves have chosen to identify. And the third general um, restriction, limitation on it is that they overlook the fact that African, Asian and all non-white people are actually a global majority. And that th they continue to be treated as minorities. Now, I just want to make reference to one um, report that came out, the Joint Committee on Human Rights, JCHR, which is a parliamentary select committee. Two weeks ago, on the 11th of November, it published a report entitled Black People, Racism and Human Rights in the UK. The report contained a survey commissioned by the JCHR, which looked into Black people's perceptions of whether their human rights are equally protected compared to white people. Now the report is interesting for all kinds of reasons, but I'm only mentioning it because it says this, um, the inquiry is focused on black people in the context of Black Lives Matter movement. It concentrates on those from three broad ethnicity groups. Black African, Black Caribbean, and Black Other, including mixed Black. We fully acknowledge that Asians and other ethnic minority groups also experience the effects of racism in relation to protection of their human rights. For example, in relation to policing, many of the issues young Black people face are also experienced by young Asian people. By focusing here on the particular experiences of Black people, we do not seek to diminish the experiences of those from other ethnic minority groups in any way. And I, I just quote that because it is complicated. It is difficult. And this is you know, a joint select committee um, that is trying to weave its way around um, how do you deal with these issues? So again, for none of us are these e easy issues. I know the time is going, so I'm going to mention two words that have come into the racial justice lexicon and um, are, are, are becoming increasingly used. And just, just to put them out there. So the first one is intersectionality. And we're all familiar with concepts of identity and belonging in a very general way. But intersectionality takes these concepts a bit further. And it began as a legal concept that sought to help people facing intersecting forms of legal discrimination to find redress. 
because it was found that the multiplicity of identities that one person could have weren't very well understood. So for example, a white woman might have privilege on the basis of her skin color, but face oppression on the basis of her gender. A black woman like myself might suffer race bias, but could have class privilege because I'm a barrister. And there, there's, there's much more to people than their race. And although race is one determining factor of, um, of how we are treated, there's so much more that makes up each of us, race, ethnicity, and everything else. So all of these dynamics play out both at individual and institutional levels. And these intersections depend on the context within which we find ourselves. Um, another popular term, which surprised me, it's actually been around for 50 years, is microaggression. And um, I read somewhere, someone said, just because insults are subtle, covert, or even unintentional, does not make them any less offensive or harmful. So how do we deal with that? I'm gonna give you a definition, and this is straight from Wikipedia. Um, microaggression is a term used for brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative attitudes towards stigmatized or culturally marginalized groups. The term was coined by Harvard University psychiatrist Chester Pierce in 1970 to describe the insults and dismissals which he regularly witnessed non-Black Americans inflicting on African Americans. So, so that, that is one, um, that's one way to look at it. If you ask somebody, so where do you come from? Um, that's a microaggression. That's considered a microaggression because you know the subtext is you don't come from here, you don't necessarily belong here. But is that uh, um, is that racist? I'm going to quote, and this is like um, just something that I, I happen to see today. My son wrote in a blog, and I probably shouldn't have identified it as my son, but he puts an opposite view across, and he says. Um, there is something I instinctively don't like about the term microaggression. It feels like a landmine that someone can step on and have their career blown up. A tripwire placed to catch the well-meaning but inarticulate or, thought or unthoughtful person. However, I understand that to the person on the receiving end of an unfortunate comment, a microaggression can feel like it's the perfect word to describe their experience. This is especially true if it happens on a regular basis. Speaking for myself as someone of Trinidad in origin who has occasionally worn an Afro, I have more than once heard someone in the workplace suggest that I must love ganja. So in this word microaggression, we have a term that feels correct to the recipient, but feels unfair to the person making the comment. In their mind, they were only clumsily trying to find out more about their colleagues' culture. Indeed, they, have gen they may have genuinely believed that everyone from the Caribbean smokes marijuana and are surprised to find that this is not the case. First and foremost, I think that people who have made mistakes need to be able to be forgiven and allowed to change and grow. If an individual who has made careless comments knows that they will forever be branded as racist, as a racist, they will be much more unlikely to admit error, learn, and become a better person for it. Generously, give people that space to improve and hope that they, in turn, will show you some charity when, they, when you make a mistake. These are lessons passed down through us, to us through religion and culture, and we would be wise to take heed of them. Now, I mention that simply because it's another view. Um, One minute, Margaret. Am I up? Is my time up? <laughs> Yogi? One minute. <laughs> One minute. Okay, so I'm asking you, um, 
and I'm putting it out there because I don't have the answers. And I'm saying, you know, it's very easy to brand people, to brand something as racist or to be too forgiving, to say, no, they were just being clumsy. They were just, they meant well. Um, how do we deal with this? And how do we deal in a, as, educa as educators when children come to us with these questions? I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, Margaret Ann, you have two questions so that um, Claudia have... is now going to put people into groups for 10 minutes okay. uh, to be able to discuss those. Okay, um, I really have only one question, which I didn't, and it is, do we as educators have a responsibility to introduce any or all of these words into our vocabulary and why or why not? I'm going to put it in the chat so people can get it. Okay. Um, Thank you, Margaret. A pleasure. Uh, um, Gloria, okay. you are now going to put people into two groups for 10 minutes. And within 10 minutes, you will all return, please. Thank you. Okay, chat. Sorry, I'm just putting it here. Thank you, everyone. come up I'm so sorry I will put it there okay isn't she uh done or not done we're we're back uh I'm, I'm glad that the uh, the conversations were still going on it's always good when you've got more to say uh but we are we only have an hour and a half and we have quite a lot to do. So I'm going to now go straight into Sudi Pombo Kono and she's going to speak to us for 15 minutes. Sudi? Okay. Hello everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I've, okay, yes, excellent. Yes, we can. Uh, well, um, uh, thank you for everyone for tuning in uh, again. Uh, my name is Sudi Kombakono and uh, I'm one of the trustees and I'm also a secondary school teacher. And what I'm going to talk about uh, today is cultural awareness in schools. Uh, a lot uh, from the tail end of the conversation I could hear, there is a real keenness to create an environment where people can have these conversations um, and for there to be a sense of goodwill about it. Because I'm sure uh, on this isn't a precise subject. We're talking about things ranging from say power dynamics to identity and how people see themselves in the world. And sometimes people will make mistakes. Sometimes people will learn. But I think that if we work together at being aware of creating a culture of goodwill in our institutions, that we will hopefully be able to learn from each other and, and, and make more, um, positive uh, inroads in dealing with, say, discrimination on every level than not. So uh, I hope that my um, fabulous assistant, uh, Gloria, uh, has put up um, the PowerPoint that I've made um, with this, um, with this one I'm, yes, there she started screen sharing. Thank you. So first and foremost, just, and I know this makes it almost in a lot of ways even harder, but there are no exact answers. There is not an exact science to how people should approach this. And when doing this, I tried to find uh, definitions that I thought were wide enough for people to be able to take from them whatever they felt needed for their own institutions and schools. So first off, I'm going to talk about what is culture. Now, uh, I found on an American website um, a, a definition. I'm not saying it is the definition, but I think it gives a very good starting point to um, from where we should go. So here it says, culture is an integrated pattern of human behavior that includes thoughts, communications, language, practices, beliefs, values, customs, courtesies, rituals, manners of interacting, roles, relationships, and expected behaviors of a racial, ethnic, religious, or social group. The ability to transmit the above to succeeding generations. And this is the most important bit, culture is always changing. Now, 
uh, what we all should be hoping to get to a place of is cultural awareness. And this is where we have recognition of the nuances of our own and other people's cultures. And what I think is that if, uh, because you know, us teachers, we always need something, a level to be working towards. Uh, and if the level we all should be hopefully working to is one of cultural competence. And this is where individuals can use academic, uh, experiential, interpersonal skills to increase their understanding and appreciation of cultural differences and similarities among and between groups. Okay. Now, uh, I think the key part of this is that we get to that level when we are able to show desire and unwillingness and the ability to improve systems by drawing on diverse values, traditions and customs. Now, I think that that is what is key and I hope that's what everybody takes away from this. The whole purpose I feel of these sessions, we can't, we don't have the answers, we don't have, this is exactly what you need to do. But I think if in your schools, in your local communities, that you as individuals express that desire and that con constant willingness uh, to improve uh, relations and um, uh, communications between different peoples within your schools, you will hopefully get to that point. So some people will ask, well, how can we do this? Um, an idea, um, that I would say that I would put towards people or put to, um, to all of you is, yes, we have used Black Lives Matter and Black communities as our starting point, almost as a case study, as you will. But I hope that you're able to go back and look at your own schools. Some, well, when I worked as a uh, schools associate in Carge, there were some schools, for example, that had in the last decade, uh, a large influx of Eastern European students. If that is the case in your communities, how are you bringing these people in? How are you drawing them in? How are you making them feel that the school isn't something that they just have to go through, but they are a part of that community? Uh, one key idea that I would say put to, um, to people is my, just with my own experience, I was asked to become a trustee. It was something that it wouldn't have even have occurred to me perhaps when looking for maybe governors and things of that nature, that as a school, you outreach to perhaps parents who wouldn't have thought that that would be a role for them. And in that way, you broaden the diversity and the environment in your school. It's just, it's just one, it's not a catch, it, I'm not saying that this is the exact way in which you need to do things, but maybe it's an idea or something to approach. I would say the if people are prepared to show a willingness to draw people in, I hope that that would be like a platform of goodwill, which everyone can move forward. Another thing that I'd also say about, say, culture, as I mentioned earlier, it's something that is always changing. Unfortunately, language and nuance means that meaning something that had a meaning maybe five years ago has a different meaning today. Um, when preparing for this um, uh, uh, Zoom slash webinar. Uh, myself and Jovi we were discussing the term BAME. Now, I'm someone, for example, who's not a fan of it, but, uh, and I don't wish to put words into Yogi's mouth, but I think that she feels that in certain circumstances it can be a useful term. And I'm sure she will be able to clarify later if that's not her position. I think it's really important to, once you are beginning that journey of goodwill, that people are given the space to self-identify before people presume how to identify them. Because how we respond to culture differs for everyone, even people who come from a very similar background to myself. So, for example, I could easily list or consider myself to be Black British. Someone from a similar background of my, to myself might uh, consider themselves to be African. That is only going to be known if the conversation is had. Yeah. So, what are moving on to say um, the next slide? And can I just check for how long I'm doing for time? Because I'm somebody who just goes to the stream of consciousness and pays no attention to time. So, if Gloria, you could just let me know how long I have, that'd be most helpful. Um, what I'd also just want is like when speaking with a lot of people, 
everybody is willing and hopeful and wants to embrace diversity in education. I think everyone acknowledges that it enriches the experience. It prepares people for a diverse world. It's a wonderful thing. And what I want us to think about perhaps is question number two, when we have our own breakout session, is what can be the obstacles in promoting diversity or widening um, the different people who come into our community and take more of a, of, a, of a lead, say within our schools or how we promote other people's cultures. What is it do you think that perhaps um, can make people a little bit hesitant to do so? And then lastly, I'd like people to think about how do we create a culture of community where everyone feels that they belong. I think that any institution, whether it's a school, whether it's a charity, uh, whether it's the police, is working at its best when it represents uh, the people for whom it serves. Now, again, as I've mentioned at the very start of, uh, my, uh, the, of the conversation that I'm having with you all, yes, the focus that we have done for these sessions has been mainly looking at, say, the Black um, community, but hopefully you will be given the confidence to feel that um, any situation where there is perhaps imbalance or, or needs work, you can work on. Perhaps in your school, it could be something ranging from how do we encourage um, uh, younger people with, uh, within our staff to take a lead? How do we encourage women to take more senior positions? How do we encourage perhaps um, uh, students from a particular area uh, to do well in our school? And all of that will come when we try to build that culture of goodwill. And from that, hopefully builds a culture of community where everybody feels that they have a stake and a share in our institution. So can I just also, so what I would like to do now, is it possible if we can just go back to uh, the, first, the first slide, how do we create cultural awareness in our schools? Hmm? We've got five minutes, Sudi. Okay, thank you. Now, while we're also talking about, they say, cultural awareness in our school, um, one of our fellow trustees, uh, Father Phil, he was always very keen on what does a school uh, show the world when people first come into the building? Does it show uh, a wide range of people who work and study there and their cultures and their backgrounds? Or is it, do, is it not necessarily doing that as much as it can? I think, especially from my own experience within walking into uh, a school or even looking for, for new opportunities. I worked at a school previously, for example, where, uh, where although it had a very large uh, ethnic minority student and teacher um, uh, staffing, uh, the SLT senior management were all white and had been for many, many years. Now, the question then comes to how do we, how would a school like that make sure that uh, being SLT is open to everyone irrespective of background? And I also do think that sometimes the method that that gives to say some of the students, even though we tell our students that they can be anything, do anything, how is that then reflected in how the school's own structure is based? So, uh, I think that I've literally, I feel like I've come to a slight uh, stop in what I'd like to say. And if it's possible, can we now go into, um, I believe we're going to have a discussion about it. So the first question that I would like to put to you all is to think about how do we raise cultural awareness in our schools? There may be some of you on this call who feel that that's something that you do brilliantly well. And I would also encourage you and hope that you're able to share some of your success stories with the wider group. Could you repeat those please, Sudi? Sure. So if we go to the, there's the slide, the question that I'm going to put to you is how do we raise cultural awareness in our schools? So what I'd like 
because I'm sure that there are many of you that are, are with us who are probably your schools do that very, very well. And it would be fantastic if those of you who feel that would be able to share how you've been able to do that within your schools. And those of you perhaps who feel that um, it's something that you'd like to do, but it hasn't happened yet. Also, please feel free to share what potentially may have been an obstacle for making that happen in your institutions. Thank you, Sudi. And uh, Gloria will now put us into our groups again, please, Gloria. Can I find out how long we are going to be in the rooms? 10 minutes, please, Gloria. 10 minutes. Okay. 10 minutes. And I heard that last little bit, Sudi. Yes, uh, we will have five minutes at the end uh, for any other extra questions. Uh, we promise that. Uh, right now, I want to hand over to Richard Zippel. Richard is our third speaker, and Richard has 15 minutes. Richard? Thanks, Yogi. I, um, I hope I can get my PowerPoint up. I'm going to talk briefly about institutional racism and the proposal for a school race equality audit. Um, now this notion of institutional racism, like some of the other things we've talked about, has been around for a long time here in the UK and in other places. But in, in the UK, it started back in the 80s uh, with the Scarman report. And in that report, Lord Scarman said that in that particular policing and, and disturbances that he was reporting on, uh, he didn't think there was institutional racism, but he said that he defined institutional racism as you know, something that was embedded in the law and purposely divided people and we didn't have something like apartheid. So the discussion of institutional racism lay dormant for a while and came back with the death of Stephen Lawrence in 1993. Stephen was killed by a gang of white young men in a racist attack in London. And there were a series of prosecutions which failed, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and it dragged on. And then in July 1997, the Home Secretary Jack Straw announced a judicial inquiry into the killing of Stephen Lawrence and the subsequent investigation. And the inquiry was chaired by Sir William McPherson. The inquiry reported two years later in February 1999. Sorry, how did I do that? Um, the McPherson report detailed numerous failures in the police investigation, and the authors of the report concluded that, to some extent, these failures were linked to institutional racism in the Metropolitan Police. And the report went on to define institutional racism. Sorry, I'm messing myself up here. Um, I don't think anybody can help me, but I'm. Help me to help. There we are. They defined institutional racism as the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. And institutional racism could be seen or detected in processes, attitudes, behavior, which amount to discrimination through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racist stereotyping. In other words, it's like a culture within an organization. 
some of which is unconscious, some of which is conscious, but which makes the organization less than a good servant of all the people. Now, this notion of institutional racism has links with the notion of structural sin, which was defined by Pope John Paul, where he says it's the result of the accumulation and concentration of many personal sins. Those who cause or support sin, evil, those who exploit it, those who are in a position to avoid, eliminate, or at least limit certain social evils, but who fail to do so, and so on. This is just, it's not, the McPherson definition is a better one, but this is a wider definition of structural sin, which could include slavery or apartheid, all sorts of things. But it sort of allows us to realize that structural sin, institutional racism, is linked to Catholic social teaching. And it's been spoken of, especially in this case by Pope John Paul II. In 1999, when the McPherson Report came out, the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales very quickly put out a statement welcoming the McPherson Report. And they went on to say, in the light of its useful definition of institutional racism, they urged all Catholic organizations and institutions to look again at how they could better serve minority ethnic communities in our society. So they put out this short statement, welcoming the report, defining institutional racism, and urging Catholic organizations and institutions to look at themselves. And there was a process of review that went on for a couple of years. Now that's 20 years ago, but it's important to realize that they didn't stop there. They actually put out guidelines to help institutions and organizations review themselves in the light of the McPherson Report. And their guidelines, which posed a number of questions, said these two things that I've highlighted. Knowing that institutional racism exists in some of the key institutions in our society, we cannot assume that Catholic organizations and institutions are unaffected. In such a situation, we become culpable if we fail to take stock and examine carefully the nature of the service we offer. And the bishops went on to say, this is therefore an opportune time to review our work in order to determine whether it reaches out to the whole community, including minority ethnic groups who might be in danger of being excluded. I hope that Catholic organizations will use the Jubilee year as the time to undertake such a review. And a number of organizations did. And reviews came together and reported back. But that's 20 years ago now. And some people with Black Lives Matter and everything have suggested that now is a time for such a review again. But not just by organizations, but also by some of our key institutions like parishes, dioceses, and schools. And we thought it was especially apt in schools, but it might not be the same questions you ask in a school that you might ask in a parish, let's say. So some questions that organizations might ask themselves. Now, th this, these, were the these were the questions that they suggested 20 years ago for Catholic organizations. What is the organization's mission? Is it a diverse community, the organization? Who does it serve? Who are its clients or its, the people it serves? What services does it offer? Does the organization have a multi-ethnic ethos and image? Is it committed to equal opportunities? Is training available for management, staff, and clients? What other positive action might bring about change in the organization and in the people it serves? So these were questions that the bishops suggested that organizations ask themselves 20 years ago. And now we're thinking, looking back then, looking at the questions they asked themselves and thinking about schools specifically today, 
in 2020. A school audit. What questions might a school today want to ask itself? In a school audit, what different or additional questions to those asked 20 years ago might a school ask itself in regard to some of these areas? The area the school serves, the pupil population, the ethnic makeup of the staff team, the mission statement, and the ethos and image of the school as seen by people inside the school, people outside the school, the curriculum and books in the library, relationships among students, staff, parents, parishes, and the surrounding community, attitudes in the school and bullying, discipline and exclusions, is there race training available? Pastoral care. So those, that's what I would su suggest that we do in groups is to think about some of those areas and think about in my school or in a school I might be associated with, how would we go about a school audit? Because it doesn't, it could be done by a small staff team, by an ongoing working group that went met through the year, by some sort of process that included the whole school. So how would we go about a school audit? And what are some of the key questions we'd want to ask ourselves? Not a question for a quick answer, but a question that we might spend a week looking at. Okay. Thank you, Yogi. Did you get that, Richard? Did I get what? Is it possible? Is it possible for us to have this the the slide with the school audit? So when people go into the groups, they have that up so that they can discuss that. Um, let me see what I can do. When Richard has that up, if Gloria could put people into groups and then we have 15 minutes for discussion. So 15 minutes to discuss what Richard has just given us now. Menai, I like your icon. Good to know we've got the doctor with us today. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm driving, so I'm struggling to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much for all for coming back again. I think we have two or three minutes for last minute questions. I know somebody wanted to ask a question after Sudi. So um, Gloria, would you be able to see hands if somebody wants to ask a question, please? I don't have everybody on my screen, so I can't see if anybody has a question. Okay. Could you, you do that, Gloria? If anyone has a question, uh, could you raise your hands or wave your hands, actually? We can only take, you say one or two, is it? I will take three. Okay, I haven't seen any hands, so. Any comments that anyone wants to make? We've got two or three minutes spare. Richard wants to make a what? comment. 
while we're wa while we're waiting in our breakout room, it was suggested that you know that people wanted to do a lot of reading, and uh, we're we're looking forward to the reading list that Margaret Ann is preparing for um, on behalf of CARGE. And I, uh, can I also add that I would really appreciate if uh, if you can send me your feedback by email. So if you have if you were in the room and you think there was something that I would need to know or Karj would like to pick up on, info at karj.org.uk. And uh, I know we didn't have any report backs, but if you want to report back to me by email, feel free to do that. Thank you, Gloria. That would be very helpful. Uh, you know, anything that anyone feels they wish to comment on or that would be important for Kaj to know about, it, you're very, very welcome to send that along to Gloria. If there aren't any more questions or if there are no other comments, can, can I ask? Uh, it leaves me to say. No. Sorry, Susan. Sorry. Wants to say something. It, it just suddenly popped into my mind when we were talking about the the other um, cards book list. The obviously recently before we met last time with the, with the comments about critical race theory being illegal to talk about in school. And, and then last week, there was an interesting article in The Guardian by a teacher saying, I now no longer feel confident to talk about racial issues and um, because of what the government's saying. And this almost like a I can't remember what the, when they talked about Theresa May and uh, sent people to other countries. That the, the, um, anyway, that sort of even the feeling that makes it difficult. And I just wondered if Karch has got any or will have any advice for teachers, recommendations, or if you will be advocating to the government um, on behalf of people to sort of, you know, say we need to be able to freely and with confidence talk about these issues that are so important to our students. So, yeah. An interesting, good article, I thought. Well, briefly, um, <clears throat> the, the critical race theory prompted us to do some background reading, and it's a it's a very interesting history that dates back to the 1930s. It started in the United States with um, the, the father of critical race theory is thought to be Derek Bell, who was the first black professor at at Harvard professor of law. And then in around 19, little before 1950 or 60, um, they met for the first time. And then it went on from there and then eventually came to this country. And there, it seems to be, it, it needs to be put in context because it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach which is pessimistic about, about change. Not, not, not wanting, it wants change and it's committed to change, but it's not entirely, you know, oh, everything's going fine and we're, we're gradually becoming the kingdom of God. Um, and in, additional, in addition to looking at critical race theory, we've also looked um, at a particular professor, um, Massingale, Massingale at Fordham, who's a black <laughs> professor um, who isn't quite in the critical race theory slot, but he, he kind of, he can both, he moves between Catholic social teaching and some of the ideas and issues of critical race theory and other things. So, oh, there's Margaret Ann has his book, um, which is, what's the name of it? <laughs> Racial, Racial justice in the Catholic church. Racial justice in the Catholic Church. Excellent book. Now it is USA oriented, but I think a lot of it, you know, is applicable. Catholic social teaching and all that sort of thing. Thank you, Richard, and thank you everybody for giving up the hour and a half to come to the, the session. Uh, if you found it interesting and you would like to, uh, a little more, we have two more sessions. Uh, please book up to come to them and uh, advertise it to friends and family who might also want to learn a little more. Uh, like it was said by all our speakers today, we're all learning. So it's about sharing. So the next session will be in January. If you go to our website, uh, you will see the dates and times there. 
Thanks once again, everyone for coming. I'm going to close now with a, an Apache blessing. You, you, you often, you know, I've had several Irish blessings and this one is an Apache prayer. May the sun bring you now new energy by day. May the moon softly restore you by night. May the rain wash away your worries. May the breeze blow new strength into your being. May you walk gently through the world and know its beauty all the days of your life. Almighty creator, bring justice to our world that your people may live in the joy of your peace. Amen. Have a very good evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.